The Ticket. Hello, welcome to The Ticket, where we discuss Black Lives Matter and an athlete's right to protest. The International Olympic Committee condemns racism in the strongest terms. The IOC... We are one race, the human race. Hello and welcome. My name is Chibogu Nadjiblam, and I am so delighted to announce that we have the pleasure of meeting with renowned Australian sports journalist, Tracy Holmes, winner in the audio category of the AIPS Sport Media Awards 2020 with her entry, The Ticket, Black Lives Matter and Athletes' Rights to Protest. Of freedom, fairness, equality, and justice. If we allow protest, we'll end the game. The Ticket. Narrow it down to your work you know, uh, talking about Black Lives Matter and of course, athletes' rights to protest. Starting with how you went about producing that particular edition, what, how did you come about, you know, focusing on that topic and also your choice of interviewees and, you know, how you got them to open up on everything that they had to open up on with regards to um, the, the show. I've been covering the protests for a few weeks leading up to that and I'd spoken to a number of athletes um, here in Australia but also in the USA and in other places because the movement just started it was so intense in the USA but then it was being picked up all around the world and it was really quite phenomenal to watch and to see that growing in momentum and then I wanted to take it to the next level and talk about the big events, the Olympic Games coming up. And we know that in 1968, the Black Power salute um, is very famous. And, and those two gentlemen were kicked out of the Olympics at that time. And I wondered, so what's going to happen if people protest again at the Olympic Games? And I know the Olympic Games has been having discussions about this and working out what is right. And so I was very lucky to be able to speak to Anita de France, the IOC vice president, because she's a black woman, she's an Olympic medalist, she's been an IOC vice president, she understands so many of the challenges of the world, but she also is very protective of the Olympic environment. And so she understands people wanting to have the ability and to have the time and the space to be able to protest. But at the same time, she wants to protect that podium so that everybody can experience it in the same way and not feel like it has been hijacked for one person's message. So there's a conflicting kind of emotion there. You know, listening to your conversation with her, it got emotional at some point, especially for you. Like, how were you able to control it considering that, you know, you're having to draw a lot of things, a lot of emotions from her as well, having to tell us how she's, she's had to live her life being a Black woman, like you already explained. Well, this is the thing, isn't it? Because you think about an, an Olympian who, who has been at the highest levels of their sport and a woman who has gone on to, um, to, to fight for women's rights and equality inside the USA and then inside the Olympic movement. But every single day, like she said, if she, if she spent time to think about what she has endured every single day of her life, it would send her crazy. Um, and to think that she has been going through this for 60, 70 years, and you just think the world should be at a better level of understanding by now. Why aren't we? Why does Anita de France still have to go through this every single day in her own country, let alone other places in the world? And she spoke very frankly also about coming to my country, Australia, and thinking, yeah. I never want to go back to that place because of what she experienced here. And, uh, and so that's, that's really touching, um, more than touching, it's, it's heart-wrenching. Putting you on the spot, okay, there is the Olympic chapter, the uh, Article 50, and of course we are having the IOC remaining adamant in the fact that no religious protest, no political, you know, being political neutral in all of that. So what is your own stance? 
I can understand all of the positions. I understand the president of the IOC, Thomas Bach, wanting to keep the peace, if you like, and 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 to you know keep something neutral. But I get really upset when I hear people say when we're talking about human rights that no, 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 we need to be politically neutral because I don't think human rights are politics. They're being used in a political way, but human rights are something that every single person on the planet deserves equally. And so that's not political. That is something much deeper and much more fundamental. And I mean, I think back to Tommy Smith and John Carlos and the Black Power Salute a lot. I talk about it a lot, I have done for many, many years. Because if you think about that moment and, and what it says mm. and how it continues to resonate, imagine if they hadn't done that. We'd still be so much further behind in this discussion. And so uh, I spoke with Gwendolyn Berry, who is a US athlete, who at the Pan American Games, I think 2019 maybe, um, she was getting a medal and it, she just had this overwhelming feeling and she put her hand up in the Black Power salute and US track and field suspended her. And then sometime later, um, you know, Colin Kaepernick and that whole movement was, was getting some publicity and wrote this letter saying, we support black athletes. And she got in touch with them and she said, hang on a second, you're sending out press releases, you're trying to get good publicity because you're saying you're on the right side of history and you support athletes in this regard. Well, why am I suspended for having a black power salute when I stood on the medal dais? And so I don't have a problem with any athlete expressing a fundamental human right that is asking for equality, not asking for any political decision, asking for a human right, I think that's a very good place to put that request. Uh, let's take a look at the ticket. What makes it stand out? I try to take a global view. And so for audiences in Australia, that's quite refreshing because a lot of our coverage of sport, we don't have a lot of coverage of sports issues. So that is unique already. But then within that, it's not just looking at a domestic market, it's looking at the stories from around the world. And that is the only way we can judge it when we start to hear other voices and other perspectives and where the rest of the world is at and what sort of challenges they are facing. And so I think within this market, it's unique. And then I think um, there, there are some people that listen internationally as well, which I'm very happy about. And I guess each time I get a guest, hopefully I have you know a, another listener in another country um, that can help spread the word. Uh, but I think the important thing is trying to get that global view and, and trying to um, connect dots because we have a temptation. We only look in our own backyard but we are all connected. You know, these stories, the big stories of sport, so for, for human rights and equality and labor laws and anti-doping and all of these things, corruption and bribery, you know, these, these are, are universally applicable in sport. 